Bon après-midi tout le monde et bienvenue à cette mise à jour sur le COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in New Brunswick. Speaking on behalf of the province today are Dr. Jennifer Russell, the province's Chief Medical Officer of Health, and the Honorable Dorothy Shepard, Minister of Health. Les porte-parole aujourd'hui sont le médecin hygiéniste en chef, le Dr. Jennifer Russell, et l'honorable Dorothy Shepard, Ministre de la Santé. Dr. Russell. Merci, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je tiens à discuter aujourd'hui des signes, encou signes encourageants que nous avons constatés dans nos efforts visant à ralentir la propagation de la COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Je veux cependant souligner que nous devrons continuer à relever des défis de taille et vous expliquer comment nous pouvons travailler ensemble afin que l'ensemble de la province puisse revenir au niveau d'alerte jaune. Je tiens tout d'abord à remercier tous les citoyens du Nouveau-Brunswick qui continuent de respecter les recommandations et les consignes de santé publique. Plus précisément, je tiens à exprimer ma gratitude aux résidents de la zone 4 qui sont en phase de confinement depuis samedi soir. Les restrictions imposées par un confinement complet ne sont pas faciles à supporter. Ces mesures créent des difficultés considérables pour les citoyens de la région d'Edmonston grand -Sault. Et je veux aussi dire que je sais qu'il y, y a des gens qui sont euh, fatigués de la COVID, je sais, mais quand on compare notre situation à d'autres endroits du, euh, du Canada, d'autres endroits du monde, je sais qu'il y a des gens qui sont vraiment euh, fatigués du confinement, mais à la face de, de pas grands changements dans les cas, les nombres de cas et les nombres d'hospitalisations et les nombres de décès. Alors oui, ici, on est fatigué de, du COVID-19, mais pas vraiment pour les mêmes raisons, parce que nous, on voit des résultats. Quand on suit les directives de la santé publique et on suit les directives de la confinement, on voit que ça baisse le nombre de cas, on voit, ça, on voit que ça baisse le nombre d'hospitalisations, on voit que ça diminue le nombre de personnes qui sont euh, affectées et qui sont mortes du COVID-19. Today, I want to report on some of the hopeful signs we are seeing in our efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19 in New Brunswick. I also want to point out the continuing challenges that we face and how we can work together to bring the entire province back to the yellow alert level. Before we begin, I have to report that we have had another death due to COVID-19 in New Brunswick and that this individual is a 70 to 79 year old who was a resident at Parkland St. John's Lily Court of Tucker Hall. And this is the 14 death of a New Brunswicker since the pandemic began. And what I just said in French was that I know that people are tired. People are tired of being in lockdown in zone four. People are, being, are tired of being in the red phase in, in recovery. And many other things are tiring people out here in New Brunswick. But I have to say that our efforts have been successful up until now. And it depends what you define as success. So when you look at other provinces who are in lockdowns, other provinces who are in, in restricted phases of their response, they're tired of being in those phases and in those lockdowns, but they're also tired of not necessarily seeing an effect on the number of cases and the number of hospitalizations and the number of deaths. So at least here in New Brunswick, we might be tired of the efforts, but we certainly see the result of our efforts being low numbers of cases, low numbers of hospitalizations, and low numbers of deaths. But no matter how people pass away, it is always sad. So our thoughts and condolences are with the members of the families of people who have passed away from COVID-19. Another individual who tested positive for COVID-19 at Parkland St. John recently passed away as well, but this death was not being recorded as COVID-19 related. And I wish to offer my sincere condolences to the bereaved families and friends. All of New Brunswick shares in your grieving. And I just want to also comment on the fact that the decision around whether a death is considered COVID related or not really is a team effort between the um, 
the attending physicians as well as public health. And sometimes these decisions and uh, discussions take time. So if people are wondering why it took a little bit longer for us to declare this one COVID-related, that's why. I'd like to thank all New Brunswickers who are adhering to public health recommendations and guidance. It is making a difference. In particular, I want to express my gratitude to the residents of Zone 4 who have been under lockdown since Saturday night. And these restrictions imposed by a lockdown are not easy to bear. And these measures are creating significant hardships for the people of the Edmonston and Grand Falls region. Thank you to all who are avoiding contact with others and to those who have sought testing when symptoms emerge. This is what's helping us get the numbers under control. These actions are helping to contain the spread of the virus. It is too soon to gauge the effect of these measures. We know that it will take time. We know that the incubation period is two weeks. So that is how long we know it will take to see the full effects of these actions. Si tous les citoyens de la zone 4 se limitent à leur bulle d'un seul ménage et évitent les déplacements non, non essentiels, nous aurons de meilleures chances de quitter la phase de confinement le plus rapidement possible. Ailleurs dans la province, les signes montrent que nous sommes sur la bonne voie. If everyone in Zone 4 stays within their one household bubble and avoids unnecessary travel, we will have better odds for getting out of lockdown as quickly as possible. And elsewhere in the province, there are indications that we are moving in the right direction. Um, and before I make any more comments about those other zones, I just want to indicate that we are breaking down the data on travel-related cases and the close contacts of those who have traveled. It is going to continue to be an issue, and that is why we, are, we have made changes to our travel restrictions. Um, it is one thing to be dealing with outbreaks that are currently underway in the province, but it's another thing to continually have to deal with new outbreaks as a result of travel. So we really need to stay on top of uh, all the restrictions and all of the protective measures that we can to reduce transmission of any travel-related case in the province. In zones two and three, the region centered on St. John and Fredericton and the growth of new cases has slowed. Our contact tracing teams, my goodness, they have been working tirelessly. I have to say, I know they have been working at least 16 hour days for many, 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 many weeks. And they, they're really focused on trying to identify the linkages between most of the cases and the case clusters. I tell you again, they, over the weekend, they, they worked so, so, so hard. Um, and because of their hard work and because of your cooperation with those teams, there is now less concern for potential of community spread because when they make those links, they can then determine that it isn't community spread. So thank you for your cooperation and all of your efforts. There have been no new outbreaks in vulnerable settings in these zones and the, those affected appear to have stabilized in the recent days. Based on this, public health has recommended to cabinet that zone two and zone three transition back to the orange alert level. This change will take effect at midnight on Tuesday. These zones will have stayed at the red alert level for a full week. This has allowed us to complete a full weekly assessment to properly gauge the impact of our measures, but be aware we will continue to monitor very closely as this, the uh, incubation period is 14 days. You will recall we discussed moving the zones quickly into red to get ahead of the risk so that we could move back to orange as quickly as possible. And part of that risk was the risk of the unknown, the risk of not knowing that the links were there or not there. And not knowing if the links were there meant that there was a risk of community transmission. Because we've done the successful contact tracing, we've re re eliminated the, the worry about that risk. That doesn't mean that it can't come again. That doesn't mean that we can't have community transmission at any time anywhere in the province. But for right now, our contact tracers have gotten ahead of these um, cases and made those links. I do need everybody to keep getting tested, even if they have one symptom and even if it's mild. The changes we are recommending are based on public health's analysis of the data and are rooted in science. We present these recommendations to Cabinet, which has the final say on these decisions. Since the pandemic began, there has been a strong collaborative relationship between public health and the COVID Cabinet Committee, which is unique in this country and which has enabled us to restrain the, the growth, the restrain the, the rate of growth of the virus. 
And again, I just want to say how much I appreciate the opportunity to work with the COVID-19 Cabinet Committee members. It really is an honour uh, and a privilege to be at that table and to be able to present all of our public health recommendations and evidence-based information to all the party leaders at the same time as the Cabinet. Zones 5, 6 and 7 covering northern and northeastern New Brunswick, you are doing well and we thank you. For now, these areas will remain at the orange level though their status is under review. We remain concerned about the new variants of COVID-19 virus, which have now been confirmed in Atlantic Canada. I was on a special advisory committee call yesterday with my colleagues across the country, all the chief medical officers of health, and I can tell you that, you know, our conversations around vaccine rollout and how we are all at the same um, level of concern around um, the fact that our supply is limited across the country and so the pace of the rollout is limited based on that and the concern around these variants um, in Ontario it's it's been quite dramatic uh, in terms of the UK variant um, uh, getting into that population and also uh, the African variants um, appearing in BC so lots and lots of concern at this time around the variants and the impacts that it will have on our response. So while we don't have any confirmed cases of the UK or the South African variants in New Brunswick, we still need to be vigilant around the rapid spread of this new COVID-19 version, COVID version of the virus. And we will be learning, just like we learned about the variants that are circulating in New Brunswick right now, not variants, sorry, the, the actual uh, virus that's circulating now. You know, we've been learning for the last 10 months about this virus here in New Brunswick. But now we have to learn about these new variants and learning takes time and it takes experience in other jurisdictions and they will be continuing to share their experiences and their learning with us. Si la tendance actuelle se maintient et s'il n'existe aucun signe du variant du virus à propagation plus rapide dans la province, nous espérons être en mesure de recommander que les zones 5, 6 et 7 passent à la phase de l'air jaune au cours des prochains jours. La zone 1 demeurera à la phase d'alerte rouge alors que la zone 4 demeurera à la phase de confinement. Des améliorations considérables devront se produire dans ces deux zones avant que, deux puissons, avant que nous puissions étudier la possibilité de modifier leur phase d'alerte. Aujourd'hui, j'annonce qu'il y a 27 nouveaux cas confirmés de COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Il y a quatre nouveaux cas dans la zone 1, soit la région de Moncton et du sud-est du Nouveau-Brunswick. Dans la zone 2, qui comprend les comtés de St. John, Kings et Charlotte, il y a un nouveau cas. Dans la zone 3, soit la région de Fredericton et de la vallée de la rivière Saint-Jean, il y a trois nouveaux cas. Il y a 19 nouveaux cas dans la zone 4, soit la région d'Edmundston et de Grand Sceau. Toutes ces personnes sont en auto-isolement. La cause de ces nouveaux cas fait présentement L'objet d'une enquête, on sait qu'il y en a parmi eux qui sont des contacts étroits, des, des cas qui ont déjà été diagnostiqués, et on sait qu'ils étaient déjà en auto-isolement quand ils ont été diagnostiqués, mais il y en a euh, parmi les 19 qui sont euh, sous une enquête à ce moment-ci. Il y a présentement 348 cas actifs au Nouveau-Brunswick. Six personnes sont présentement hospitalisées en raison de la COVID-19, dont trois aux soins intensifs. If the current trend holds, we hope to recommend moving zones 5, 6, and 7 to a yellow alert level in the coming days. And I did mention that, um, you know, it would be helpful if people who have symptoms get tested because then we, we feel more confident uh, that the information that we have is reliable. And I heard somebody raise the question about rapid testing and why aren't we using rapid testing, but Honestly, our targeted approach right now is around diagnostic testing, and that's the PCR-based testing. The rapid test, there is a PCR test that's a rapid test, but it's used in very specific areas, and the supply is limited, so we use it very judiciously for some pre-op testing and for some long-term care facility outbreaks uh, to manage those at the early stages. So the other rapid tests that we do have available are, they're called rapid antigen screening tests. And they, we do have good supplies of both of them. One is the Abbott ID now, and the other one is the PanBio. Um, but both of those are used best in situations where people are symptomatic, 
Um, and, uh, and again, there are some downfalls, uh, there are some drawbacks to using them. So we do have a plan to use them um, in very specific areas and for very specific reasons under specific circumstances. But it wouldn't be under the, the, the guise of mass testing of asymptomatic people at this point in time. But again, we are working with our partners with the lab uh, and um, all of our public health partners in the province to, to continue to make sure that we have the best testing program that we can. Today, there are 27 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in New Brunswick. And in Zone 1, which is the Moncton and southeastern New Brunswick area, there are four new cases. In Zone 2, which is St. John, Kings and Charlotte counties, there is one new case. In Zone 3, which is Fredericton and the St. John River Valley, there are three new cases. In Zone 4, which is the Edmonston Grand Falls region, there are 19 new cases. All of these individuals are now self-isolating, and the causes of these new cases remain under investigation. And um, many of them would be close contacts of cases that were already diagnosed, in which case they were already self-isolating, but some of them are, uh, are still under investigation. There are now 348 active cases in New Brunswick. Six individuals are currently in the hospital, including three who require intensive care. And again, I ask that you keep every New Brunswicker whose lives have been touched by COVID-19 in your thoughts and prayers today. The resurgence of COVID-19 cases across New Brunswick over the last month has been alarming. But in most cases, there is no mystery in how it has spread. Obviously, the cases come across the border not knowing they have COVID-19. They may or may not have symptoms. They may or may not self-isolate appropriately and safely, um, unbeknownst to them. And unbeknownst to them, they may asymptomatically transmit to their household members who may asymptomatically transmit to their workplace, a school, um, a public area. Um, and, and sometimes people do have symptoms and those people don't get tested. So we know that if somebody comes across the border and self-isolates for 14 days appropriately, then you won't have spread. Uh, but if anybody comes across the border for whatever reason and isn't self-isolating uh, in the safest way possible, and again, some people think they are self-isolating safely, but still are at risk of transmitting. So we know that you know, there, is, there is always going to be risk that travel-related cases are going to occur. And if people are not wearing their masks and are not physically distancing, um, then there are other risks uh, uh, in terms of getting COVID-19. So contacts with others in workplace settings, school settings, social settings, again, without physical distancing and without wearing masks and without hand washing, et cetera, and, and being in close contact with people uh, in those types of situations then increases the risk of transmission. And that's not new. That's been the case since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I do have some images that we're going to show. You, are, you have them on a screen? No, 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 no. Okay. No. Oh, well, I wanted to look at them. I wanted to look at them also. Um, <laughs> I have them here. Okay, you see them on your screen, and I'm going to show the first one. Slide for zone one. In these images, and the reason we're doing this is because people are asking, well, every time we've done any stakeholder engagement sessions, um, people find the visual aspects of these uh, quite striking. Actually, I don't have the one for zone one. Okay, well, I'll just have, well, I'm gonna read it, yes. In these images, uh, each case is represented by a dot, and the lines between the dots show contacts between cases, and that is the work that the contact tracers do. Shout out to the contact tracers. Many of these dots do not connect. If you see dots that are connected, um, then that illustrates that we're having issues in several communities. Um, and again, we, we can see that, you know, there could be several clusters that start all at once, again, from travel, um, and then they spread in a community, in a region. Sometimes they spread between zones. So this image shows how the virus spread through zone one in the Moncton region. And you can see that there is one very large cluster of cases that surrounded that is surrounded by a series of smaller ones which may be connected to the larger one. Again, really complex. And over the holiday period, if somebody went to a, uh, a party or a gathering of some kind, then the virus got passed on that way. And then from there, it spread from a gathering to a family, to the family and friends, and then to their workplaces, and then their schools, and then into vulnerable settings. So now I'm gonna show the, 
the picture for zone 4. Alors, regardons maintenant ce qui se passe dans la zone 4, où le nombre de cas a augmenté en flèche au cours des deux dernières semaines. Dans cette région, le virus est répandu dans le cadre d'une série de rassemblements sociaux pour ensuite s'infiltrer dans des lieux de travail, y compris la ferme avicole Nado et plusieurs établissements de soins de longue durée. Cette image montre clairement que nous ne savons pas encore comment bon nombre de ces cas sont liés les uns les autres. C'est l'une des principales raisons pour laquelle la zone 4 se retrouve présentement en la phase de confinement. Alors, pour la zone 2, zone 2. So, let's take a look at zone 2, which is the St. John area. Here we have two large clusters, which overlap, and there were gatherings uh, involved, and, and some of the outbreak is uh, related to the Shannox long-term care facility. And I was asked the other day about the index case and um, in terms of the transmission to that setting. Um, but I don't have all the information around that. And again, we have to be very careful with our confidentiality. I mean, there's only three ways that it can get into a care home. It can be through staff. It can be through a visitor. It can be through um, a, a resident who leaves the facility to go on an outing and then comes back. So somehow it did get in there. And, um, and again, we have to be sensitive around those issues because obviously nobody knowingly brings COVID-19 into a vulnerable setting. Anyway, that gives us a picture of zone two. For zone three, let's look at that zone, the Fredericton area. Now, we see that there's a pattern that, that is repeated among all of these. You can see that you, it is spread in the different clusters beyond uh, home gatherings and during the holidays and then into workplace settings and then um, family and friends of the workers in those workplace settings. So again, very complex. L'image illustre aussi comment le virus peut se répandre dans les lieux de travail. Quatre cas dans un milieu de travail se sont transformés en une grappe de deux douzaines de cas supplémentaires parmi les amis et les membres de la famille des employés. These images tell different stories, but they have this in common. The virus will spread at every opportunity if we let it. Too many of us let our guard down over the holidays, which is why we are where we are today. But also, I think on a daily basis, every choice that we make around whether we're wearing our mask, whether we're physically distancing, whether we wash our hands, whether we leave our house when we're not feeling well, whether or not we get tested if we have symptoms or a symptom of COVID-19 affects whether or not this disease is transmitted. We can't roll back the tide of any of these cases, but we can take actions to keep the second wave from getting worse. And the most important thing we can all do right now is to monitor ourselves and our families for symptoms of COVID-19. And when those symptoms emerge, seek testing as quickly as possible. The symptomatic testing that we do is PCR-based, uh, and the turnaround time can sometimes be slower than people would like. And I have heard complaints about people not really wanting to self-isolate during that time because it is inconvenient. But we are asking that everybody do this for the province. This is what we all need to do now and moving forward so that we can avoid seeing the, the variants come into our province and prevent the variants from spreading. And so we can do our vaccine rollout program so that we can protect as many New Brunswickers as possible. So yes, it's an inconvenient. Yes, it's, it's a problem, but it is necessary. And symptomatic testing is really, really much, much better than asymptomatic. The only time that asymptomatic testing is really valuable is in a targeted population where you know there's a risk. For instance, a close contact of a case who's been self-isolating, and we are doing that testing on day 10 of their self-isolation. Even if it's just one symptom, even if it seems mild or trivial, testing will help us identify how the virus is spreading, and it will enable us to get people into self-isolation and keep it from reaching everyone else. Time is of the essence, so please don't wait. Les tests de dépistage nous aideront à déterminer comment le virus se propage et nous permettront d'assurer l'isolement des personnes qui en ont besoin de façon à éviter qu'ils se transmettent à, aux autres. And we have a targeted testing strategy. We ramp up our testing efforts when we have to, set up additional assessment sites when required to do so, that people um, do not have to travel as far to seek testing. We've done this in the past in Zone 5, we're doing it in Zone 4, and with an additional assessment site in Clare. 
We also have added a testing site in Perth Andover in Zone 3 and a site in Sussex in Zone 2. Another site is being added in Sackville in, in uh, that Zone 2, Zone 1. Oh, it's on the border. And discussions for Lamech and Shipigan are taking place. Oh, I said Shipigan. Shediac. It says Shediac. Um, we conduct large-scale or facility-wide rapid testing in vulnerable locations and workplace settings in concert with our prompt teams. A shout out to the prompt teams. Oh my gosh, they have been going all around this province delivering the most effective um, testing and isolation for all of these uh, long-term care facilities, adult residential facilities, and nursing homes. Uh, they are working tirelessly. So great, great shout out for this group of people. Um, I cannot say enough about how they're helping uh, these vulnerable populations. Um, amazing. So by taking these targeted actions with your support in following public health guidance, I am confident that we can bring these outbreaks under control and get New Brunswick back on track. And I would like to clarify that tomorrow night at midnight means Tuesday into Wednesday. So demain soir à minuit, ça c'est le temps qu'on va uh, aller à la phase orange dans les zones 2 et les zones 3. Thank you very much. Minister Shepherd. Thank you, Dr. Russell. Merci, Dr. Russell. Not only is public health um, contact tracing and, and all of everyone there working diligently and hard, so is, is Dr. Russell, um, Dr. Heidi Liston, the ADM of public health. This has been a absolute marathon pandemic. And the amount of hours that, that public health um, employees have put in are just extensive, grueling, um, and certainly not the easiest thing to do. Um, I, I just want to say a heartfelt thank you to all of, all of you at Public Health, all of you in the community, extramural, running our prompt teams. You are exceptional and doing a tremendous job. Good afternoon, bonjour. Before I begin today, I want to express heartfelt condolences on behalf of all New Brunswickers to the Premier and his brother Denny and their family on the loss of their beloved mother, Bertha Higgs, at the age of 100. Losing a parent is never easy, but it is especially hard right now when we can't come together and grieve as we need to. Our thoughts and prayers are with the Higgs family today and in the days ahead as they deal with this heartbreaking loss. As well, our province has had another person, has lost another person to COVID-19. This is something that never gets easier, nor should it. On behalf of all New Brunswickers, I want to express sincere condolences to this person's family and friends and all who love them. The number of active cases today, as well as the overall number of active cases, continue to be higher than we need them to be. As Dr. Russell has noted, the majority of today's cases are in Zone 1, the Moncton region, and Zone 4, the Edmonston region. This has been true of the past few days as well. In other zones, we have seen the spread of COVID-19 reduced. Because of this, we are accepting the recommendation of public health and are moving Zone 2, the St. John region, and Zone 3, the Fredericton region, to the orange alert level Tuesday, eve Tuesday night at midnight. The decision to make this change tomorrow night was based on a recommendation from public health to allow a full seven days to pass since these zones moved into the red alert level. Zone 1, the Moncton region, will remain at the red alert level. Zone 4, the Edmonston region will remain in lockdown. Zone 5, the Campbellton region, Zone 6, the Bathurst region, and Zone 7, the Miramichi region, 
will remain at the orange alert level for now, and we will continue to reassess the situation. We need to keep these zones in orange for now to assure the health and safety of those who live there. But if trends continue to go well in these zones, we will move all three to yellow once public health recommends we do so, hopefully later this week. To ensure success across the province, I encourage everyone to continue to follow the directives of public health and take the steps necessary to keep you, your loved ones, and your communities safe. Today, I am happy to share that we've now had five days without a confirmed positive case in any school community. Since schools reopened after the holidays, a total of 20 schools have been impacted by confirmed cases as well as seven early learning and child care facilities. Only eight schools continue to be impacted, three of which are in zone four, the Edmondston region. There are no longer any positive cases affecting child care facilities. We are five months into the school year and there has still been no student to student transmission determined in any of these cases. Our return to school plans have proven to be successful time and time again, but we need the continued support of New Brunswickers to keep our schools healthy and safe for the remainder of the school year. As we all know, the virus does not move on its own. If we limit our movements as much as possible, we can limit the spread of COVID-19. Some movement will always be necessary, of course, but we must continue to find ways to reduce the risk to New Brunswickers. Effective this past weekend, travel into the province was restricted further. Everyone entering our province must self-isolate for 14 days. There are exceptions for those who travel back and forth daily for work, commercial transportation operators, and those who must travel for medical care, child care, and child custody. As well, those commuting for work or school have to do work isolation. These travelers must now submit to mandatory weekly COVID-19 testing. As Dr. Russell has said, testing access has been improved to make this easier. I understand that these measures may seem inconvenient for New Brunswickers, and I get it. We're all very tired of this virus. But know that by complying with public health directions and observing these measures, you are making a difference and you have the power to protect lives. We have also stepped up enforcement across the province to ensure that the rules are being followed. Most of our focus is on businesses and organizations because if they are doing the right things, then in that in turn protects their staff and customers and goes a long way to protecting our community as a whole. We recognize this hasn't been easy for businesses and I encourage businesses who are impacted by the pandemic to call the Business Navigator at 1-833-799-7966 or email nav at navnb.ca, that's nav at navnb.ca for help. Enforcement officers have observed that the majority of business and patrons are actively cooperating with current direction. However, if there are cases of people clearly violating the emergency order, action will be taken. I'm sure many of you have heard about the actions being taken this past weekend at protests in Moncton and Quispamsis. It is important to note that the issue was not the protest. People have the right to protest, and if they are doing so lawfully, we will support their right to do so. That was the case in Woodstock this weekend, where a pro protest also took place. In that instance, protesters wore masks and maintained physical distancing. However, if people are not respecting the mandatory order and are putting the community at risk, I know the police will take action. We understand that people are frustrated, but putting others at risk is not acceptable. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Vaccination clinics were held Friday and Saturday in Edmonston, 
Bathurst, Fredericton, and St. John to vaccinate more than 1,950 healthcare workers. That followed clinics last week where more than 1,300 people were vaccinated at 10 long-term care facilities. In total, we have administered 14,257 doses of the vaccine and have fully vaccinated 2,839 people in New Brunswick. And our work vaccinating New Brunswickers continue. Vaccination clinics are planned for 20 long-term care facilities this week, using the Moderna vaccine to provide the first dose to more than 750 people. And more than 1,600 healthcare workers are scheduled to get their second dose of the vaccine this week. This is positive news, but we still have months to go before we reach that light at the end of the tunnel. It continues to not be a matter of our ability to vaccinate, but that we do not have the vaccine in sufficient quantities yet. We all need to be patient and continue abiding by the guidance from public health to, from public health, but to take the time we need to get people, while well, we take the time we need to get people vaccinated. Acts of kindness and caring go a long way at the best of times and are even more appreciated when times are challenging like they are now. Since the pandemic began, a group of Edmonton volunteers called Les Ongles Bienveillants, our caring angels, have been helping vulnerable members in their community. They have delivered groceries and kept in contact with people who are living alone. Now that the region is in a lockdown once again, they have expanded to include more acts of kindness for those in need. On top of this, they have done things such as clean snow off the cars of healthcare workers who are working the night shift at the Edmonston Regional Hospital. These are simple acts that have a huge impact on both the giver and the receiver. There have also been reports of cities outside Zone 4, the Edmonston region, taking to social media to share messages of support, reminding those in lockdown that they are not alone. The act of reaching out and making a connection, one community to another, or one individual to another, will help us get through this pandemic. Yes, New Brunswickers are resilient, but this is hard. We need those reminders that we are not facing this alone. Please continue to support one another in any way you can. That is how we will come out the other side of this challenging time stronger as people and a province. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Ms. Shepherd and Dr. Russell. Thank you, Mr. Shepherd, Dr. Russell. We'll now proceed with questions from members of the media. Each reporter will have one question and a quick follow-up. You have the right to pose your question in the official language of your choice. Please ensure your microphones are placed on mute. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux questions des journalistes. Vous avez le droit de poser vos questions dans la langue officielle de votre choix. Chaque journaliste aura une question et un suivi. Voulez-vous assurer de désactiver le son de vos micros? Natalie Sturgeon, Telegraph Journal. Thanks. Uh, my question is for Dr. Russell. Um, Shanix did announce uh, on Sunday that there were two deaths at Parkland St. John. I think you mentioned one of them. Um, why, why did public health not report these deaths on, on January 21st and 22nd? And, um, and what do they know about those specific deaths in relation to the COVID outbreak at Parkland St. John? Uh, just before I answer that question, I just, for clarity, uh, the zones two and zones three are going back to the orange phase Tuesday at 11.59, just for clarity purposes. Alors, pour, uh, pour clar clar clarifier, les, les zones deux et trois vont être remis au, à la phase orange uh, mardi à 11h59 p.m. Alors, ça c'est demain soir. Um, so to come back to the Shanex cases, um, 
All I can really say is, is what I have already said uh, during my remarks earlier, and that is that the decision around whether somebody's death is linked to COVID or not, or attributable to COVID or not, is based on the attending physicians as well as uh, public health. And so when they make those decisions around the cause of death, um, then that is what I would report on. Um, it is a collaborative effort. So um, again, the case that I re the case that I reported today uh, around the um, attrib attribution to uh, the death being to COVID-19, again, I'm, we're following our protocols and our processes around that. Ms. Sturgeon, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, um, I just wanted to know, uh, Dr. Russell, if there's any scientific data that um, would point to a defining difference between a patient who has COVID-19 or is tested positive and then passes away but is not a COVID-related death? Um, well, again, they have protocols around defining a COVID-related death or not. Um, you know, there are people with obviously multiple comorbidities at the end of life. Um, so there are multiple things that would be contributing to somebody's uh, death. You know, the timeline between when they tested positive uh, and their death, were their symptoms, were those symptoms exacerbating already underlying medical conditions that they had? I mean, there's a lot of complex discussions that have to, discussions that have to take place. Again, it's a collaboration between the attending physicians, because there can be more than one, as, as well as uh, public health. Thank you, Ms. Sturgeon. Vicki Hogar, CHCO-TV. Thank you, Bruce. My question is for Dr. Russell and or Minister Shepard. Maine CDC estimates seasonal influenza rates to be down about 85% as a result of, result of personal protective measures. Do we know if the seasonal influenza rate is down in New Brunswick this year as a result of our protective measures like social distancing and mask wearing? And have there been any positive hospitalization trends because of the precautions we've been taking? Uh, my understanding is yes to both of those questions. Yes, our rates of transmission of flu have been down and our rates of hospitalization of flu have been down, but I will confirm that and I can get uh, somebody from communications to give you that data because we, we actually have a, a weekly flu report that has that in uh, our document. So it could actually be on the website right now. So you actually have access to that. It reports on flu and it also reports on uh, influenza like, so it, it, it reports on influenza number of cases, number of hospitalizations and deaths. It also includes influenza like uh, symptoms as well and, and illnesses. Ms. Hogarth, do you have a follow up? Uh, Dr. Russell, Canada is spending on average about 5% of its positive COVID-19 cases to the National Laboratory to test for the UK strain. Why not send all positive cases, especially in New Brunswick where we don't have as many as other provinces? Well, we have a lab group that works on all of these issues around what goes to NML and what doesn't. Um, so, and again, that's in collaboration with public health. So these teams meet uh, weekly, sometimes more than once a week. Uh, to, dis to discuss all of these issues and the te technical components around that. So uh, I am comfortable with the testing, of the, of the samples that are sent right now, um, and I'm comfortable with their uh, ability to determine if something needs to change in that area. Thank you. Jacques Quattro, CBC. Hello. Uh, for Dr. Russell or Mr. Shepard, where do things stand with um, any changes, adjustments to vaccine rollout given the reduced Pfizer numbers. I see that today Ontario, for example, says they're going to delay some shots for healthcare workers to favor long-term care residents. So are you making any decisions like that here? Um, for us, the vaccinations are affecting um, healthcare workers because we are using the Moderna vaccine in our long-term care facilities. And so those vaccine rollouts will continue as, as planned. Um, so right now we will be utilizing vaccine as we receive them. We are dependent on the federal government for those um, for those shipments, and um, it will not be affecting long-term care um, at this time because of the fact that we are using Moderna. Mr. Poitra, do you have a follow-up? I guess I was using that as an example. Did you, are you planning any changes to your planned rollout to account for the lower levels of Pfizer vaccine coming in February? Well, we can't get issue vaccines if we don't have the vaccine to to release. So, so absolutely, we are making those changes. We have been assured that the shipments will be um, will be ramped up in March, 
and so that um, we should be able to meet our planned um, vaccination um, rollout for Q1 um, in, uh, in, the, in the month of March. That has yet to be seen. We can only hope that that is what, um, that is what will happen. And we will certainly ramp up our vaccinations in the month of March to try to fulfill, um, to fulfill the, uh, the plan that we have because you know, our goal is to get to September and be where we want to be. So these kind of adjustments have to be made. We have to work with them um, and we will continue to do so. So I expect March is going to be very busy. Thank you, Mr. Quattro. Laura Lyle, CTV. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, the question would be for Dr. Russell. Um, with the situation in the, well, what is the situation in the Moncton region currently? Uh, and why is that so not moving in the same direction as St. John and Fredericton? So in terms of what, what is happening in Zone 2 and Zone 3, again, we were, we were seeing that all the, the, the cases that we were worried about not being linked were, were able to be linked. Uh, so the contact tracers, again, they worked really, really hard over the weekend to make those uh, linkages. And uh, I think in Moncton, we're, we're just still continuing to see workplace transmission. So we're going to be keeping an eye on that uh, as we move forward. But again, I know they're working very, very hard as well. Uh, and, uh, and again, we'll, we'll continue to monitor that situation. Ms. Lyle, do you have a follow-up? I do. Uh, it's, as far as I understand it, the residents of Kirkland St. John have all received their, their first vaccination dose, uh, with the exception of Lily Court and Portland Court. Um, families inside of Portland Court especially uh, want to see their family members vaccinated now that the number of active cases is down to, I believe, five. Is that something that's going to be happening? So there is a clinic that is being planned shortly. Thank you, Ms. Lyle. Harry Forstel, CBC. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, a question to uh, Minister Shepard. Uh, can you please explain how people will be alerted that they're going to be vaccinated and how those who are without a family doctor, who lack a New Brunswick health number, or who are still registered with another province's health care system, how they will be contacted and uh, told about their vaccinations. So as I explained um, before, many, of, many individuals will, will actually be, um, be alerted by Medicare, and so that's going to take care of one group that, that, um, that you've asked about. And so they're going to be coming in a, in a um, you know, we will be targeting those right now they're 85 years of age and older and once we've gone through this first quarter then of course those uh, numbers will come down to 80 and 75 and 70 and medicare will take care of identifying those who we already know as for individuals who may be awaiting um, i'm thinking you might harry be referring to citizenship or permanent status in the province um, as we also provide them with medical services, I'm sure that we have a way to identify them. Going to have to confirm that with you um, to be absolutely assured of that. But as I've been working through the department and being briefed at different times, we certainly are in touch with most of them and especially through our, um, our associations who support them. And we will ensure that no one is left behind. Just to clarify, it also affects people moving from other provinces who may be Canadian citizens from the get-go, right? Right. So I, we're going to have to uh, confirm, one, that they're not vaccinated in another province, and I know that there is a transition time. I'm going to expect that these individuals are most likely mobile and, um, and that they, you know, they would be going through the process. So by the time we get to September, we should be able to come through and identify all those who have... Um, have not received their vaccinations yet, and anyone can certainly contact um, contact the Department of Health or Public Health to ask that question on behalf of any of their family members. Mr. Forstall, do you have a quick follow-up? Yes, I do, Bruce. This is for Dr. Russell. Um, is Public Health looking at or dealing with 
the phenomenon of so-called long-haul COVID. In other words, those patients who have been diagnosed and treated for COVID-19, but who weeks, days, weeks, or months after uh, still have uh, uh, the effects of uh, COVID-19. I'm going to step in on Dr. Russell for this one. Um, so I had mentioned in previous uh, briefings that we do actually have a group, and I thought it originated in St. John, but it's actually Moncton City Hospital, I believe, who are following COVID patients who, um, who have um, become COVID infected um, and then following them to see what those long-term uh, long effects are. And um, I would be very happy to get you the, uh, the researcher on that. And, and you could follow up with them to see where they're at with it. Brad Perry, CHSJ. Hi there, thank you, Bruce. This question is for uh, Dr. Russell. I wanted to go back to the, uh, the two recent deaths at Parkland St. John. You did mention one of them is not considered a COVID-related death. Uh, back in December, Public Health had introduced an update to the dashboard to add a non-COVID-related death category after a resident there who tested positive died but not of COVID. Uh, it looks like as of right now, it doesn't appear this most recent case is being included as part of that category. Can you maybe explain why, why that is? Well, I can certainly bring, back, bring that back to our team. Um, but as of right now, again, the protocols around our reporting are, are based on that assessment between public health and the um, uh, attending physicians. Uh, and our, dash, our dashboard will be updated accordingly. But uh, that's, again, we're following the protocols that we have in place right now. Mr. Perry, do you have a follow-up? I do. Thank you, Bruce. This is also for Dr. Russell. I just wanted to clarify, you mentioned there were two resident deaths at Parkland and St. John last week, one Thursday and one Friday. Can you confirm which of the two deaths were COVID-related and which, which of the two were not COVID-related? Well, I think that would be breaching confidentiality of the families of the uh, residents involved, um, and I wouldn't want to be releasing any personal information. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Marie Sutherland, CBC. Hi, my question is for uh, Dr. Russell or Minister Shepard. Um, last week, the Department of Health confirmed delivery of uh, almost 200,000 or something like that rapid tests to New Brunswick. Um, and Dr. Russell, you were sort of suggesting these are of limited use, but what is the plan for their use? That's a lot of tests, and I know airports, for example, keep stressing that these are crucial. So what, what is the plan for their use? So. I'm going to walk you through the test types again to talk about what they're used for and what they're designed for. So the test at the George Dumas, the PCR test, that's the gold standard. It does take a little bit longer, but is the most um, uh, reliable for symptomatic and asymptomatic testing. We do have one that's also PCR based that's called GeneXpert. It's more, it's able to be used uh, uh, for quicker turnaround time, but the problem with that one is that we just have very, very few uh, limited, very, very limited supplies of that across the country. So every province has to use that very, very, very judiciously. So we do it for some pre-ops, we do it for some uh, long-term care facility outbreaks early on. Um, and again, it can be used for symptomatic or asymptomatic people. So the other two that are considered rapid antigen tests, uh, yes, we have them in large numbers. But they are limited to be used for people who are symptomatic, number one. Number two, um, the Abbott ID rapid test uh, has to be used by about day seven of somebody being symptomatic. Um, both of them have problems with um, reliability in terms of, uh, uh, you know, specificity and sensitivity. Uh, in particular, the PanBio has, has more limitations around um, false negatives and false positives. So both of them, the Abbott ID now and the PanBio, both have to have uh, confirmatory tests with the PCR. So you're going to be double testing the ones that are positive. And if you have negative tests, you're not completely uh, uh, confident that they actually are negative, so you could be missing some. So there are some very limited uh, ways that we do plan to use both of them. I did have a list um, last Thursday and Friday. I don't know if I have all of the um, the lists of how we're going to use, but I do have that list, and I can make that available to you because we do have it. Let me just actually. I know I have it. Sorry. Ah, 
I do have it. There we go. Okay, I know I have the list for the Abbott ID now. I don't know if I have everything for PanBio. So, uh, so again, the Abbott ID now is a point of care test. It is a rapid test, but it's an antigen test. It's not a PCR test, and it's a screening test, not a diagnostic test. And um, we do have min several Abbott ID now point of care testing uh, um, uh, products in the regional health authorities. Um, again, it's a screening test. It's only really valuable for symptomatic patients and, again, has to be confirmed uh, with uh, the George Dumont PCR test. There are 41 of these instruments around uh, in the regional health authorities and uh, they have 22,632 um, tests to be able to do those tests. Um, and again, I know I have a longer list of what the PanBio will be used for as well. I'm just we're going to have to get that to you, but I do have the total list of what both of those are going to be used for. Well, actually, all four, actually. Okie dokie. Thanks. Are we good, Miss Sutherland? Yeah, thank you. I, I do have a follow-up question. Quick one. Um, Dr. Russell, uh, have you been dealing with people who are refusing to get tested, specifically NATO plant workers, and is getting tested actually voluntary in a case such as NATO? Um, well, we can't force anybody to get tested. That would really not be something that public health would be able to do. However, if somebody doesn't choose to get tested, then they probably would be asked to self-isolate for 14 days is my assumption. Uh, that's usually how uh, they, would, um, they would approach that. Thank you. Jean-Philippe, Radio-Canada. Oui, bonjour. Donc, la question a été posée en anglais, mais j'aimerais l'entendre aussi en français, si vous voulez. Donc, pourriez-vous nous expliquer ce qui ralentit le passage de la zone 1 à la phase orange, comme les zones 2 et 3? Alors, euh, la réponse que j'avais donnée en anglais, c'était vraiment euh, à, à propos de la sorte de transmission qu'on voit maintenant dans la zone 1. Plus la plupart de la transmission qu'on voit maintenant, c'est des lieux de travail. Vu que tu as suivi... Oui, euh, j'aimerais avoir euh, une mise à jour au sujet des foyers de soins de la zone 4 où il y a euh, des éclosions, donc le manoir Bellevue, la résidence au Pelletieu et la Villa des Jardins. Est-ce qu'on pourrait savoir combien il y a de nouveaux cas dans chacun de ces trois établissements? Oui, OK. Euh, alors, euh, dans la zone 4, il y a Villa des Jardins. Il y a, il y a euh, un employé qui avait testé positif. On a commencé tous les, les dépistages le 24. Et euh, ça, c'est 81 résidents, puis 22 employés. Puis euh, on attend pour les résultats à ce moment-ci. Puis la prochaine fois qu'ils vont faire le dépistage, c'est le, le 27 janvier. La manoir Bellevue, c'est... Euh, euh, on a vu qu'il y avait quelqu'un qui avait testé positif. Euh, on avait fait deux, deux jours de dépistage, le, le 20 janvier, le 23 janvier, avec des, des cas positifs... Euh, Chaque fois, en total, en total, il y avait 21 résidents et 12 employés qui ont testé euh, positif. Et euh, la prochaine fois qu'ils vont faire du dépistage, c'est le 26. Et le, aussi dans la zone 4, il y a le pavillon, pavillon, pavillon Royer. Euh, il y avait quelqu'un qui avait testé positif. Et euh, ils ont fait du dépistage le 21 janvier. Sur, sur, <coughs> les résultats étaient tous négatifs ce jour-là et euh, le prochain dépistage, c'était le 25. Alors ça, c'est aujourd'hui. Alors on, on recevra des, des résultats, j'espère, euh, demain. Ça va? J'ai Est-ce que je pourrais savoir dans ces trois résidences-là, lesquelles avaient déjà reçu une, une première ronde d'un de, 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 vaccin de Moderna, j'imagine, et lesquelles n'avaient pas commencé la vaccination? Euh, vous voulez savoir quel, euh, quel de ces résidents ont reçu le vaccin déjà? Il faudrait que je, retourne, oui. je, je reviens avec cette information. Simon de la Lac et dit nouvelle. Oui, question pour le docteur. Plus fort, Simon. Plus fort. Oui, oui. Des résidents de la Croix et de la nation de l'Utigouche, donc là. Maintenant, on va subir un test de dépistage euh, s'ils veulent pouvoir euh, passer la frontière. 
quels sont vraiment les bénéfices de ce test-là, étant donné que les personnes ne seront pas testées le même jour euh, que lorsqu'elles voudront passer la frontière Alors, passer la frontière pour rentrer au Nouveau-Brunswick Exactement. De, en, hors, en hors du pays ou en hors, dans d'autres endroits du Canada Pour rentrer au Nouveau-Brunswick. Alors, vous demandez si on fait des dépistages ou c'est quelle la valeur Dépistage, étant donné que euh, le, le passage de la frontière ne serait pas de la, de la même journée que le, le test de dépistage. Euh, ça, c'est pour des travailleurs essentiels, vous voulez dire Tout, Toutes les personnes qui souhaitent, euh, qui, qui souhaitent traverser la frontière pour euh, des biens essentiels doivent subir un test de dépistage depuis euh, la, semaine, la fin de semaine dernière, je crois. So let me, I apologize, I must answer in English. Um, so at Pointe de la Croix, there, there are uh, residents are able to come over once a week for necessities. They may come over for work. They may come over for medical appointments um, and any other essential travel such as childcare custody. Um, and these um, regular travelers are subjected to a COVID test uh, weekly. And so it wouldn't be on any specific day, but I would assume weekly appointments would be made for them uh, to en enable their traveling. Thank you, Minister. Oui, une question au sujet de, de, de l'étude de l'Institut de cardiologie de Montréal au sujet de l'efficacité de la colchicine uh, pour traiter la COVID-19. Uh, est-ce que la santé publique du Nouveau-Brunswick uh, compte analyser ces résultats et est-ce que ça pour, uh, ce médicament-là pourrait être administré aux, aux patients du Nouveau-Brunswick Alors, uh, on a discuté uh, avec, j'ai discuté hier avec mes collègues, uh, tous les médecins hygiénistes en chef, uh, tout à l'entour du pays, avec les, études, les, les recherches qui ont été uh, publiées. Uh, il faut falloir uh, d'autres uh, discussions sur les recherches. Uh, pour les valider. Euh, alors, on n'a pas vraiment euh, des directions à ce moment-ci sur cette euh, recherche-là, euh, euh, à ce moment-ci. Merci, M. Delat. Tom Bateman, Brunswick News. Hi there. Uh, I have some questions about a job listing for two of the province's regional medical officers of health. Uh, without getting into personal details, uh, I wonder if either of you can tell me how long these positions have been vacant and how exactly the work of the public health department uh, has been affected by turnover in these leadership positions, you know, during, you know, perhaps the most difficult period this province has seen, you know, in contending with a global pandemic. Thanks. So it's my understanding that job postings went up mid-December. Um, the vacancies have only um, happened, I believe, this week. Um, and, and so those, we are, working together with our other um, medical officers of health to cover off areas and with Dr. Russell, Dr. Um, Muick, who works with her, um, in, in, in continuing the support to the areas that are necessary. And of course, the processes will, will go through um, in, re, in having those, uh, those positions replaced. And uh, I would just like to add that um, while Dr. Paquette and Dr. Lamte were uh, working in public health for the entire time that I've been in public health, um, it is a loss that we will uh, definitely feel. They were excellent, excellent uh, medical officers, um, you know, as acquaintances, as friends, as colleagues, uh, very much valued their expertise uh, throughout the time that I've been in public health. So yeah, we're, we've been looking at different ways of filling the gaps. Um, Recruiting obviously is, is uh, not, it's not easy in the best of times, but certainly during a pandemic we'll have some challenges, but we're, we're working very diligently uh, with HR and uh, myself and Dr. Muick, the Deputy Chief. When I was first hired as Deputy Chief back in 2014, um, my job was actually to cover the regional medical officers of health when they were on leave. Uh, I covered, I think I covered mat leave for Dr. Lamptey. Uh, I covered sick leave for other positions. So uh, I, I'm very familiar with the work that they do. Uh, I think we're all stretched right now, but I know that Dr. Barker has been covering reg uh, the Fredericton's region and the 
St. John region has been doing an excellent job. Uh, Dr. Legere covers the Moncton region. So yeah, we'll have to um, combine all of our efforts to cover uh, the north and, and hopefully the positions will be filled sooner rather than later and, and uh, we'll have a full complement of medical officers. Mr. Bateman, do you have a quick follow? -up? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Uh, I just wanna shift gears uh, and go back to those graphics that uh, you presented earlier, Dr. Russell. Can we have some more information about what exactly those are portraying? Perhaps you can tell us you know, whether the different shading or size of the dots uh, represent something. Um, maybe what, you know, there's some of those dots have two lines between them instead of one, um, or maybe, you know, what time frame is being represented in the images. Can we just have a bit more on that? Thanks. So when I, we, we have presented these slides many times, myself and Dr. Liston, uh, to COVID cabinet. Uh, we've presented them to leaders in different zones. Um, they're a tool to help us understand help others understand what we know, because we're working behind the scenes, so we have all the intel. But it's hard to really break that down into, into um, digestible bites for people and t without giving away too much with respect to confidentiality. So there are way more details that uh, accompany these slides in terms of who, where, what, and how. Um, but, uh, you know, for the representation purposes of, of, of showing how complex the connections are, how connected we all are in the province, that's really the point of this, is that the asymptomatic transmission that happens uh, through events, workplace settings, school, the, uh, the symptomatic transmission that happens when people do not get tested and go to any of these places, um, it really provides a snapshot of what it is that we want people to understand so that they can then change the behaviors to address the risks that we're identifying here. So the risks we're identifying are, one, if you're self-isolating as a result of travel, please do it properly. Number two, knowing that it can happen that you're not doing it properly for whatever reason, um, your household members are at risk. Uh, they are at risk of transmitting asymptomatically. And certainly anybody with symptoms who, who goes to different functions, workplaces, uh, et cetera, is at risk of transmitting. So that is why we want everybody who has even mild symptoms to get tested. Thank you, Mr. Bateman. Savannah, uh, Telegraph Journal. Uh, hi, this could probably go to the Minister or Dr. Russell. I'm wondering if you can update us on how many health workers and long-term care workers in Zone 4 are isolating and if there's any concern at this point around hospital or ICU capacity as a result. So Savannah, I do have that information with me. I'm sorry I can't do it off the top of my head. I have to look at cheat, cheat notes. Um, so a total of 84 healthcare employees are off work due to COVID-19 related reasons, 50 in Horizon, 25 in Vitalité, and 11 extramural ambulance New Brunswick. Four surgeries were canceled in Horizon Health on Friday. Um, and that can sometimes be because of medical staff, but it can also be that individuals who are booked for surgery um, couldn't get their test results done in time or back before their surgery date. Ms. Odd, do you have a follow-up? I do, thank you, Bruce. Um, this one's for Dr. Russell. Um, you mentioned your concern, of course, about the variant, um, and you said some five, six, and seven might move to yellow in a few days if we continue to see no evidence of the variant here, if I heard you correctly on that. Um, so have we seen trends, I guess, in the test results or in our communities that suggest that the variant is unlikely to be here yet? Could you maybe just uh, tell me about that? Well, we do have criteria around which samples we send to NML for uh, analysis and uh, genetic sequencing to see if the variants are here in the province. So every all the tests that we've sent so far came back negative for the variants. Um, I'm not sure if we have any outstanding right now. But certainly our conversations, um, again, my, my conversations with my colleagues yesterday with the Chief Medical Officers of Health from across the country were quite... Um, concerning in terms of what they're seeing in their provinces, such as um, uh, Ontario and British Columbia, around the variants and, and what risks uh, are now, they're now faced with because of that. So, you know, we're, we're, we would, our goal would be to go to um, uh, yellow in terms of having uh, those areas that don't have cases and we're not at risk 
um, the way the other zones are at the moment. But with the introduction of that variant, um, the spread can be so quickly, qu so quick. Um, we're just we're just really evaluating what uh, what those elevated risks mean. So we've sent 19 samples already for the genetic sequencing. 14 came back negative, and we've got five that are pending. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Ms. Ard. Jill Duval, TVA. Oui, bonjour. Bonjour. Il serait possible de faire état de la situation pour ce qui concerne la thermoconado ainsi qu'il y avait des cas potentiels aux résidents Jourdain, domaine des bâtisseurs. Est-ce qu'il est possible de savoir quel est l'état de la situation, donc thermoconado et domaine des bâtisseurs dans la zone 4? Merci. Alors, euh, pour le NADO, il va y avoir des dépistages pour tous les employés euh, aujourd'hui et demain. Et l'autre question, c'était pour un, un résidence ou… Euh... On a parlé de domaine des bâtisseurs, euh, résidence Jourdain, là, à un moment donné, qui avait comme euh, cas potentiel, on n'a pas eu vraiment de suivi à ce chapitre-là. Because all negative tests. Okay. Uh, je crois que l'éclosion à Jodoin a été déclarée uh, fin, terminée uh, parce qu'il n'y avait pas uh, d'autres tests positifs. Parfait. Donc, vous dites que pour faire Nadeau, il n'y a pas eu de nouveaux cas au cours des derniers jours, si je comprends bien. Mais le dépistage, il va se faire aujourd'hui et demain. OK. Peut-être si je, je pourrais avoir une question additionnelle, c'est qu'il semble avoir une certaine confusion, justement, euh, dans la région du Omaroaska, on, on, on se pose beaucoup de questions à savoir, lorsque une personne est testée euh, positive, euh, le conjoint ou la conjointe à l'intérieur de la maison, cette personne-là a le droit de circuler dans la communauté si elle n'est pas été accusée du contraire, n'est-ce pas? Euh, ben, à ce moment-ci, c'est décidé par la santé publique et le, nos, nos, nos infirmières qui font le traçage de contact étroit. Alors, si c'est quelqu'un qui se le contact étroit d'un cas, il va falloir qu'il fait leur auto-isolement, mais c'est vraiment une décision, une conversation entre les euh, traçages de contact et trois. Merci, M. Duval. Bobby Jean Merci. McKinnon, CBC. Yes. So, Dr. Russell, the non-COVID related deaths you discussed today isn't reflected on the dashboard, yet the total number of deaths recovered and active cases add up. And there's still one death announced by Shannix on January 12th, not reflected on the dashboard at all as COVID-related or non-COVID-related. So why is that? I will have to get back to you on that. Um... Next question. Okay. Uh, Dr. Russell and Minister Shepard, please. Um, Families of Shanex residents who tested positive for COVID and died are suggesting public health is misrepresenting their deaths as being non-COVID related. How do you respond to that? It's a really difficult time for families and I appreciate that, but there's absolutely no reason for public health to not be upfront as much as possible and, and have been um, with this. So there is there's absolutely um, no cover-up, no, no uh, skewing of data. Um, this is a clinical decision, and we leave that up to the clinicians to give it to us. Thank you. Mia Urquhart, CBC. Thanks, Bruce. My question is for Minister Shepard. The province's licensed practical nurses have asked government for a meeting to discuss a number of their, of their concerns, including wages, responsibilities, and job classification. This morning, their union said the province is on the verge of a recruitment and retention crisis. QP has also raised a number of issues. How concerned are you about losing LPN over these issues, and do you plan to meet with them to discuss their concerns? First, I want to say that every single province in this country is under a recruitment and retention crisis. <laughs> it is, um, it's no secret that in the healthcare um, sector, we have a shortage of healthcare professionals in almost every single category. Um, secondly, I understand the LPN situation and, and their, their angst, 
at, um, at wanting to meet. I certainly don't have any objection to meeting with them, um, but I, I certainly would like to ensure that we have all the information that I need before that kind of a meeting takes place, since I'm sure that that won't be in the too far future. Ms. Urquhart, do you have a follow? I do. This one is for Dr. Russell. Are there any plans to tighten self-isolation rules to require that if someone in a household has traveled outside the province, every member of that household must isolate for 14 days, as is done in Nova Scotia? And if not, why not? Uh, my understanding that in the mandatory order, it specifies that if you cannot isolate safely away from your family members in the same location, then you should go to a different location. That's my understanding of how it reads in the mandatory order. And my understanding is that Department of Public Safety, uh, either on their written, uh, their uh, computerized registration forms or verbally will ask people about their self-isolation plan. So obviously, proper self-isolation for a full 14 days by yourself in a location away from others is the safest way to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. We saw that this past summer with all of our, our uh, temporary foreign workers and our international students who all self-isolated by themselves uh, for the full 14 days. Uh, and of all of the thousand people who did that, um, I think we had a handful of positive cases because they all got tested on day 10 of their self-isolation, but not one of those cases transmitted to another person because there was no ability for that to happen. So moving forward, uh, the strictest self-isolation that can happen should be happening. Again, if you can't self-isolate safely away from household members, then you really should self-isolate in a different location. Thank you, Ms. Urquhart. Sour Plowman, Plowman, CB, CTV. Hi, um, we're hearing concerns across the country about vaccines, about Pfizer not having any vaccines coming to Canada this week, and you talked about it earlier, but can you share with us just how concerned is New Brunswick with the lack of supply coming into the country right now, and how is that hindering your progress? Um, you said that you'd reach, you know, quarter one targets. Um, but, but I don't know, are you, are you able, is, is it, um, if you could explain how this is helping or hurting you guys right now? I think it's creating an angst in the public, certainly no, no doubt. And, you know, our whole goal is to ensure that we have, you know, our Q1 people, which would be, um, healthcare professionals, it would be long-term care residents. Um, and, 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 and so we want to ensure that, that we get them vaccinated as soon as possible. You know, we know that we could vaccinate up to 4,500 people a day if we had the vaccine. We know we're not going to get that much. So we are asking everyone to be patient, to work with us as we, we move forward. We have created priority groups because of the fact that we know we don't have enough vaccinations to give, um, um, on a daily basis, the, you know, we, we have to, to some extent, rely on our federal government to get us the supplies we needed and we need. So um, they work with Pfizer uh, on a daily basis. Pfizer has maintained that our supplies will be ramped up in the month of March, giving us that, um, that supply that we had planned for in, uh, in January, February, March, so that we can be um, on target at the end of March. And we are going to hold fast to that. That's our plan. And uh, we will give vaccines out as quickly as we get them. And are you hold in a on, position Sarah. or have you? Sarah. Ottawa? Sarah, just let the doctor answer first. Sorry. Oh, so, oh, sorry. Yeah. So we're all in the same boat across the country. So each and every jurisdiction has the same issues around the per capita uh, allocation of the procurement uh, of all of the doses of vaccines that are purchased at the federal level. So every province is in the same boat. Nobody is able to vaccinate as quickly as they would like. So that's across the board in Canada. And certainly, um, you know, if we're all trying to get to the finish line of herd immunity by, you know, September-ish 2021, you know, that's many months from now, and whether it's the two M mRNA vaccines that uh, allows us to do that or the ones that are hopefully going to be um, approved by Health Canada, 
uh, over the coming months, then however that's going to happen, then obviously we'll be glad to get to that point. Uh, there are barriers and obstacles along the way that we all as a country have to deal with, uh, including New Brunswick. So the barriers that we have right now, again, is, the, is that, that per capita allocation is not going to change. The rate of the delivery of the doses is not going to change. If we could accelerate it, we would, absolutely. And there are some unknowns around that. So uh, yes, we know that Pfizer is guaranteed that they're going to give us enough doses um, in the month of March to be able to meet our targets by the end of March for long-term care uh, facility residents and, and health care workers. So uh, it's just, again, it's just taking a longer amount of time. Now, what happens after Q1 and, and in terms of the doses that we're going to be getting after that? It, again, up in the air, but again, if everything goes well, if everything goes exactly how we would hope, then we'll have another priority group vaccinated between April and June, and then the rest of the population will be vaccinated between June and September. But again, that's if everything goes well, and I know many, many things are going to change between now and then, including what the risks are across the country in terms of uh, the variants affecting us, um, the continuation of travel-related cases carrying those variants coming internationally and domestically. Um, and so that's why the bottom line, regardless of how the vaccine rollout goes based on those limitations, uh, we all have to do our part right now to protect the healthcare system and the healthcare workers so that when we do uh, want to give those vaccines that uh, we have enough healthcare workers to do that, that and they're not busy taking care of COVID patients and, uh, and that everybody's here to receive the vaccine. So we don't want anybody left behind. Do you have a quick follow, Ms. Plowman? Yeah, given the information you know now, which of course might change, but given what you know now, how will you, what is your strategy then to be able to reach your target by Q1? You mentioned uh, some healthcare workers won't get vaccinated. About how many won't get vaccinated and what else will you have to do to be able to quickly, you know, vaccinate more people if the doses come later? So the clinics to administer the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine um, are not planned for this week, but our, our work is continuing for vaccinating New Brunswickers. And the vaccination clinics are planned for 20 long-term care facilities starting today using the Moderna vaccine. And uh, so we'll be providing the first dose to more than 750 people, and that's going to be held in zone 1, 3, 5, 6, and 7. More than 1,600 healthcare workers are scheduled to get their second dose of the vaccine this week. There are no first dose clinics planned for the Pfizer vaccine. Knowing that these interruptions can happen, um, we took that account with respect to second doses and they are going to be administered within 28 days. And while the clinics to administer a first dose of uh, Pfizer are, um, sorry, I said that already. Um, So if there are any additional unplanned events that occur that would not allow us to maintain our 28-day interval, we do have, we have reserved a 14-day window within which we can readjust our vaccine allocation to ensure second doses are provided within the national recommended time frame of 42 days. And we continue to use that same plan, uh, that same approach moving forward. Uh, I do want to commend the, um, the, the Immunization Task Force on their work that has contributed to all of this. Uh, the planning is extensive. Uh, the collaboration with other groups within public health and within, within the regional health authorities has been outstanding. This is a very complex time uh, with respect to uh, the, the, the nature of, of some of the unknowns that they're working with. So they did try to build in some of those unknown factors into their planning. Uh, with contingency plans and, and what have you. So we're working on the technical side and the operational side very well together at this moment in time. Uh, again, around you know what, what happens if there are these delays and, and what are the, the timeframes that we have to work with and what are the changes that we can make within those timeframes. Thank you, Ms. Plowman. Patrick Giguère, CHIU TVA. Alors, pour les... peux-tu répéter la question, s'il vous plaît? Oui, est-ce que les travailleurs du Nouveau-Brunswick qui euh, voyagent au Québec matin et soir pour aller travailler à l'épicerie dans un garage euh, doivent se soumettre aux tests de dépistage de COVID-19 euh, et est-ce qu'ils doivent être en isolement à leur retour à la maison? 
Euh, L'information que j'ai reçue sur les dépistages sur les travailleurs essentiels qui viennent chaque jour, euh, je crois qu'il faut faire tester euh, au moins une fois par semaine. Ça, c'est l'information que j'ai reçue, mais si s'il y a d'autres détails là-dessus, je pourrais euh, vous rendre les détails. Pour, donc, ça, ça s'applique tant aux Québécois qu'aux néo brunswickois qui vont euh, travailler matin et soir à les retours. C'est bien ça? Pour les néo brunswickois pour les néo brunswickois OK. Euh, parce qu'il y a certaines euh, entreprises gaspésiennes là, qui euh, craignent, justement, avec ces nouvelles mesures-là, euh, que leurs euh, employés qui demeurent à Camelton, par exemple, et qui se rendent à Pointe-à-la-Croix, euh, donc euh, les, euh, il y a certains employés qui euh, bon, euh, vont peut-être, euh, ça va être plus difficile peut-être pour certaines personnes de se soumettre à un test de dépistage de COVID-19. Donc, ces entrepreneurs-là euh, s'inquiètent de perdre certains employés qui ne voudront pas euh, subir un test de dépistage. Qu'est-ce que vous avez euh, à leur dire pour euh, peut-être les rassurer? My apologies, I have to answer you in English. Um, so, employees from Québec who work consistently in New Brunswick, Would, would be subjected, and I, I, I'm assuming the employer has gone through the proper protocol to make proper uh, arrangements, they would most likely be tested weekly. They're, they would be um, expected to work isolate, meaning that they only go to work and they go home. They do not um, be about in their communities. A New Brunswick employee who has to travel into Quebec for work must again be, um, be tested weekly in order to continue that. It is inconvenient. This is a difficult and inconvenient time. And lots of New Brunswickers don't even have the benefit of going to work. So this is a way that we can protect our people. And those who are coming to New Brunswick to do a job and are only coming here on a one-time one deal will have to self-isolate for 14 days. This again is for the protection of our communities in both provinces. Monsieur Ligueur, suivi. Euh, oui, ben, bon, euh, du côté de la MRC Avignon, il n'y a aucun cas actif de COVID-19, donc ces mesures de dépistage-là vont euh, We are constantly assessing. I would expect that these, these measures will last. Um, really, I believe these are new measures brought forward um, to Cabinet by the recommendation of COVID Cabinet Committee. And I believe they will be in place for the foreseeable future until we get through our vaccination process, until we have um, you know, mass vaccinations out there in our communities, until we understand the variants that are now um, we are at risk of being exposed to. I believe that this, um, this, this, this uh, procedure and these uh, restrictions will be in place for the foreseeable future. Oui, c'est vraiment pour gérer les risques qu'on voit augmenter euh, au niveau des nombres de cas qu'on voit euh, tout à l'entour du monde et aussi l'effet du variant du Royaume-Uni. Ça, c'est déjà dans 30 pays déjà. C'est dans l'Ontario. Euh, on a les variants de l'Afrique euh, en, en la Colombie-Britannique à ce moment-ci. Alors, euh, les risques augmentent, alors il faut gérer les risques. Et la seule manière qu'on peut faire ça, c'est avec les changements euh, qu'on introduit à, à ce moment-ci. Et vraiment, jusqu'à le temps qu'on dit que les risques sont euh, diminués euh, et, et euh, on a le vaccin euh, dans la plupart des gens ici au Brunswick, euh, je crois que oui, euh, comme le ministre Shepard a dit, c'est vraiment important euh, pour, euh, pour gérer les risques comme tels aujourd'hui, euh, jusqu'à temps que le, les risques diminuent. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Voilà la fin de notre mise à jour. That concludes today's update. Thank you.